ERS-1 was the first remote sensing satellite for the environment that uh, ESA had flown. Uh, there were meteorological satellites before, but uh, ERS-1 was the pioneer uh, measuring all types of different environmental information, but uh, the, the first in Europe. ERS-1 um, was the starting point for everything that in a lot of the observation capabilities that we have in space now that we take for granted. After ERS-1 we had many other missions, so basically uh, ERS-1 is the, the grandfather of all other missions. In July 1991, the European Space Agency launched a unique Earth observation satellite from Europe's spaceport at Kourou. And over the days after launch, it's called the launch and early operations phase, the satellite was stabilised, the instruments are switched on, and then they're checked out to see that they're working correctly. And that's where the problem started. We were waiting for the first data to arrive, and in particular, the, the data of the radar imaging, uh, in English, synthetic aperture radar, SAR. So we were waiting for that because that was really the, the main instrument of ERS-1. So we were waiting for you know, the first image. This was from, from the start, this was going to be the exciting thing. And I think it was on uh, Saturday, if I'm not mistaken, it may have been July 27th or 29th, and the data was uh, to be received. There were, the primary station was Karuna, and Fuccino, which was a secondary station, was, was listening in. A big VIP event was planned down in Fujino Station for the first SAR acquisition. I think they even uh, took the, the Minister of Research down there, but uh, all the Italian VIPs. So in real time, the satellite downloaded the data. It was recorded onto high HDDT, high density digital tape. Then the tape was played back into the SAR processor. And um, in those days, there was a CRT uh, monitor, cathode ray monitor, where the image as it was being processed would scroll up. And what scrolled up was basically unrecognizable, grey, streaky rubbish. Not a sour image at all. I, I always describe it as, it's like uh, when the, the old TV channels used to stop broadcasting and you get snow, nothing there. So that was, uh, unexpected. The, the image resulting of that processing was uh, very blurred. Blurred at the point that uh, my colleagues like Mark Duerty and uh, Steve Cousin were desperate. That's where the panic set in. I kind of think the minister kind of said, we just paid 500 million euros for, for this. And um, there was a serious concern that the satellite wasn't working correctly. There were also a lot of um, anxiety in our management uh, here at ESRIN at headquarters because ERS-1 really was the first satellite and we were not completely sure that the problem was in the processing. It could have been a problem really on board with, uh, with the instrument, meaning that we would have failed the development of that, our first Earth Association satellite. You don't know whether it's really a problem uh, with a satellite, I don't know, shaking? Is it the, the, the SAR instrument on board where there is a, a, the, the, the radar antenna partially broken or not completely open? Uh, is it something going wrong in the, the transmission of the signal? Uh, so there are plenty uh, of, um, uh, of reasons that it does not work. So the tape was shipped back to Ezrin and that's where um, actually, Mark and Henri, who were leading the investigation, began work to try and find out what the problem was. I was a bit of a, a, a bystander in those days, but uh, I was obviously had some previous SAR experience and was, was following the investigation. We got the data from Fuccino, and by the way, at that time there was no internet, so someone had to carry on on the car the, the, the tapes, it's about 100 kilometers from here. And then we, uh, we got the tape where we had the raw data and we process as well and it did not work. We had a complete replica here in Ezrin of the fast delivery processing chain which is installed in all of the receiving stations. 
and um, Henri quite correctly began a very systematic, methodical uh, check, step by step, of uh, what was going on, whether the uh, data was being ingested properly into the SAR processor, whether the SAR processor was configured correctly. But all of this was taking a lot of time, and each time he did a, a check and a run, the results were the same, this horrible, grey, streaky rubbish. The same thing, by the way, was, was in progress at Kiruna Station with what was called the project team. So these are the guys who designed and built the satellite and they were, uh, again, systematically going through. So there was a bit of a race, if you want, uh, between the project team in Estec and uh, the, um, the, shall we say, the amateurs down in Ezrin, the guys who, uh, who hadn't built a satellite but were going to process the data and work on the applications. They were at a disadvantage because they didn't have a system that was really set up to let them easily uh, understand what was going wrong. We had a thing called the Verification Mode SAR Processor here in Ezrin, which was fully configurable. You could change all the processing parameters. It had bells and whistles. You could uh, do all sorts of things with it. And they didn't have that at Karuna. They had a machine there, the FDPC, the Fast Delivery Processing Chain, built for speed, uh, hardwired and uh, less configurable. We ran it through the processor and actually up did come an image, but it, it, it was a mess. And, uh, but what I really visibly recall from that, one of my, our colleagues, Henri Lohr, who was the, the, the he, he was specialized in SAR processing and, and applications. I remember vividly seeing Henri standing in front of this awfully, awful image and pointing out, it's Flatterland. There's the transponders, I can see these things, and we were all saying, the guy, he's... And I remember I was looking at that image, and I knew where it was. Actually, uh, that image was uh, acquired uh, over the Netherlands, uh, the center of the Netherlands, the, the polder called Flevoland. And I remember I was saying to, to, to Mark, look, I can't recognize, it's very blurred. But uh, here we can see Amsterdam, you see, we see Utrecht, and we see Flevoland and Mark, well, well, that's not really... Uh... And he was absolutely right. He could recognise it. So we were... Um, Henri was, was changing the parameters and he was doing this uh, with the, the real genius of the story, who was Paul Lim, who was the engineer in Vancouver who had designed and built the VMP, which was sitting here in Ezrin. So we were on the phone to Vancouver. Um, it was quite late in the evening here, early in the morning in Vancouver, and we were uh, telling Paul what the results were of the changes that he'd made to the processing. With Paul, he was actually rebuilding the software in Canada, uh, uh, recompiling it so that we could run it in Ezrin, and we were processing the data and doing the analysis. And what actually happened was we did that first processing and then we said let's change some of the processing parameters precisely what they couldn't easily do in Karuna we just changed the number and reran the processing and you know what it happened it made it worse we up scrolled the, the image it wasn't the image it was the blobs and they got further apart but that was wonderful because we could go and and, and with a ruler literally on the image measure what should have been a point and instead was a blur and say well it's twice as blurred as it was before then we talked to paul and he said well if that's made it worse maybe this could be the source of the problem and uh, what he did was based on those very rough estimates uh, figured out that if we flipped uh, a, a plus to a minus basically in the processing maybe it would make it uh, better. Suddenly so I had the idea, ah, yeah, but maybe we should try that, which is to invert what we sell the I and Q channel of the signal. Okay, let's stop with um, the systematic stuff. I've got a wild idea. I'm going to change something and let's see what happens. So I did that. We reconfigured the code, we re-ran. You know, at that time, the image did not appear immediately, it was tac, 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 huh? And then we saw the image as it was being processed coming scrolling up, and we were just, it was 
a perfectly beautiful focused SAR image. And suddenly the image was perfect, you know? Like a revelation. So uh, that was quite a moment. And when that happened, uh, Mark went into orbit. Um, there was a whole stream of, uh, shall we say, colourful language. It was joy and jubilation. I, I, I mean, I, I don't think you remember the moments of <laughs> what you said or what you did. I think we were, um, I mean, we, we felt it was a sort of history being made. Mark started to jump everywhere. The handset and the telephone fell off the desk. Uh, there was a little voice coming out of the handset saying, oh, what? I can't hear you anymore. What's happening there? What's going on? So we, uh, we told Paul the good news. I remember as well there was an operator with us. You know, he was one of the computer room here at the screen. And uh, he was from Naples, he was young at that time. And Mark was really happy, Mark was jumping everywhere. We are making history, we are making history, we are making history. And that operator, uh, Roberto Napi, said, ah, really? That's, uh, I'm going to call my mother in Naples to tell her any call. It was like one in the night. <laughs> I'm making history. That was really, uh, really funny. And uh, we uh, actually then phoned the head of the department, Livio Morelli. I think it was about midnight. We also phoned the head of the establishment, Francis Rochan, and they both came in. Uh, I don't know how many heads of institutes would do this today, but they both came in and we had uh, a glass of Prosecco each and uh, saw the fantastic results. They were all waiting with bated breath, you know, wondering, um, you know, this what's the issue or are we going to solve this so just being able to pass the message on that uh, the satellite worked uh, the instrument was working perfectly uh, was you know being the bearer of of good news um, i still remember saying um livio we better phone the project guys in karuna and tell them you know we know what it is and he said no wait until the morning i'll phone my director Tell him that we've solved the problem, then we'll phone the project team. The first image was Flavorland, and actually the problem that Paul had the genius to understand was there was a simple and stupid uh, misinterpret, a misdefinition of the signal components. They're called I and Q, and the telemetry definition was the inverse of the definition in the processor. So switching that, everything worked perfectly. That was a trick. It was something really very basic, but no one were con uh, confronted to that problem of the I and Q inversion. And by the way, with Follow one satellite, we had problems like that, even with Ambisat, but we knew the trick, so immediately we do that and then it worked. But at that time, we had no clue. Satellite was functioning perfectly, the SAR was functioning perfectly, and I can tell you uh, there were a lot of relieved people because I don't think this was the first satellite, 500 million euros, and if it really was uh, kaput, I don't think we would have had ERS-2 or Ambisat, or the Sentinels flying today. And you know, looking back now, that moment was the start of all of these, you know, amazing use and application of, of SAR, not just with ERS-1, ERS-2, Envisat, Sentinel, but also with RadarSat and with satellites that have been developed afterwards. They've learned so much from that whole, so that was um, an absolutely seminal and thrilling moment to be in the midst of all of that. Yeah, they were really concerned that the satellite might not work and they could have been obviously for ESA uh, a big failure which may have prevented us to do then the follow on the generation of ESA, and probably which would have prevented us even to go the step forward with the Sentinel and the Copernicus program. So that in reality that uh, ERS-1 uh, first image uh, and the, I would say the anxiety they had for 48 hours 
then was removed and then we have seen uh, 30 years of progress in association at, at ISA uh, with industry, with our member state, uh, but the, the start of all, beyond Meteosat, for Meteo, the start of all was ERS1 and in particular that, uh, those first SAR images. And after that, of course, everything uh, was, was just fantastic. We had the pleasure and the privilege of working with the world scientists on the first uh, C-band SAR imagery and developing all of the applications from scratch. And uh, that's where I had some fun a few months later in the field of SAR interferometry. You know, my memory of that is just how lucky we were to be able to use those tools, work with those people, and benefit from the expertise. I remember more or less I didn't sleep for 48 hours in that story, but still, this is probably my best uh, professional experience, and it was very early in my career, so an, an incredible souvenir for me. There was information in the, on agriculture, on forestry, um, on oceans, on ocean waves, on ice. You could just select all of these images and put them up and people, you could see the science community just roaring to go and, and work on it. And uh, the rest is history as they say. Now it's all routine and commonplace, but in those days it was trailblazing and a privilege to be working with those people. Today we, there's been a long discussion about the archive data, preserving the archives. Well, some of the observations, the planet has changed in 30 years. Sea level has gone up, temperatures have gone up, there has been deforestation, there has been urbanization, there has been coastal change, there have been glaciers retreating. That data has contributed to our understanding of all of that, but it's vital, it contains the record of how the planet was. So, uh, I mean, everyone who contributed to that was laying down uh, a historical record whose value today is, you know, enormous. The one thing I learned from all of that is that people who are in the space business, problems are normal. You know, you're not to be surprised that things don't work and you sort of get organized to understand and solve the problems. And I think that was the, my first real exposure to, to how that worked. And as I was saying, I, I think we were dead lucky to have the opportunity mm. to just to be in a, in a place to do something about it. But you no, know, the thing is, I, you know, we're sitting here discussing it and I, I, I think we were just a tiny part of, you know, a, an amazing team sure. of people, you know, sure. and uh, we, we were just happened to be there uh, and we'd had, I mean, it was the foresight of uh, actually uh, Livio and the, the STEC team to develop this processor because if I think if we had not produced the image there it would have probably come about within oh, the next right. 20 hours or so yeah, because the, the guys up in in, uh, Karuna. in Karuna were doing it and and I also realized Paul was actually you know in he was getting the information on both sides so he was uniquely placed to be able to win and solve it but I just think of the people you know one thing is that moment but actually just you think of the amazing experts that, and, and, and people we were able to work with and without us having had the opportunity to work with them, uh, you know, we wouldn't have had that experience and it's really that team of people, you know, who made all of that happen and I think for us looking back now, uh, more than just the moment, you know, of that, the, the joy of that is just thinking what it took to bring it to all of that, all of the skills. And I think there's 80 companies around Europe who built different components. All of those experts, instrument experts up in STEC that we were working with, you know, you could benefit from all of their expertise. Yeah. That, that is, and I think that's the essence True. of ESA. I remember in March, we did the first experiment to say you could do differential interferometry yeah, yes. so you can measure millimetric motion from space yeah, with, with those crazy corner reflectors nailed across Germany. thing about they all that is we were in the middle, I mean it wasn't us who did it, we were in the middle of an organization that had teams of industry, teams of scientists, the best scientists in all the ESA member states and beyond who were all working together and you could ask them would you do this, would you do that? Uh, and it just
clicked into place and produced these miraculous results. First yeah. result. And that was First just, I think that was like the learning experience for me or is this is how you operate a mission. You get up to achieve what the mission is, uh, can achieve and then, and that's what's been done yeah. with Envysat, with the explorers, you yeah. always understand and from that, you know, learn how to do more. Yeah. I think that's what the success really is. It's about, yeah. you know, going Deve beyond what you're initially... Developing, developing the science, which allow to develop the application, which develop the user interest, and uh, and then we do even better satellite, more uh, uh, more accurate, uh, more diversified, and uh, here we are. Now we are 30 years of archive, where we see the, the indisputable fact that the change are fast, especially in the, in the polar areas. Yeah. And that's also a sense of uh, achievement because you see what we have uh, contributed to, uh, to develop, the usage of first observation, has been fundamental really to open the eyes that it was truly a climate change ongoing, not only with the temperature in the ground, with whatever uh, occurs on Earth, in particular in polar areas, with all satellites, yeah. uh, we, will know we will know much less. That's Indeed, no, but uh, the satellite role is, is fundamental in the awareness of uh, uh, climatic change uh, and not a climatic change, you know, like we had in the past, but a very fast the one. The speed at which it happens, yeah. yeah. You know, we've been part of, you know, delivering all this information about what's actually happening on the planet. It's been immense progress to know what's going on. Um, it would be great if there was a similar progress on people actually taking action based on the information. I mean, huge uh, insights and scientific knowledge about what's changing on the planet. Policies, remember when we were doing all of that work in the in the 90s, governments were writing, you know, the, the framework convention on climate yeah. was set up. Though it, there wasn't an established scientific opinion that said conclusively that climate change was linked to human impact. That came uh, in the late 90s, yes. early 2000. Uh, so I mean, we were working with the science community who had for more than two decades had been busy putting the observation systems together when that came through. But uh, I, I think we still have a long, long way to go before you'll see people uh, who, you know, really seriously take the decisions based on the evidence. I mean, uh, how, you, you sometimes ask, uh, is that an invented memory or did it really happen? <laughs>